Queen Margaret took control of the Lancastrian forces as she was a really good leader. And she managed to rally the forces behind her, gain the upper hand over the Duke of York when they met at the Battle of Wakefield in December 1460. The Duke of York witnessed his troops dying in front of him. He felt wave after wave of Lancastrian forces smash his forces back. More than once he thinks about retreat, but now it is too late. He's cornered in and has nowhere to go. He's set upon and overpowered by the Lancastrians. In the distance, Margaret hears her troops' success and orders them to liberate Richard the Duke of York's unruling head from his body. The Duke's underlings, the two Earls of Rutland and Salisbury, are taken as prisoner and executed for treason. Margaret then orders the Duke of York's head to be adorned with a paper crown and placed on a spike at the gates of the city of York in the ultimate humiliation. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the channel. This is, of course, part number two of the War of the Roses series. In part number one, however, I mentioned that I really do enjoy giving back to charity, but as a history teacher, it's not always financially possible. Therefore, if you're feeling giving, please find the link down below in the description. All of these funds will be used for charitable purposes. Currently, I'm raising funds for Mercy ships, which are literally hospitals on ships that go around to places that don't have hospitals and help people out. So if you're feeling charitable, please go find the link down below. Now, let's get into this. Queen Margaret marched her victorious forces to London in an attempt to have a throwback to the Roman triumphal parade. But when they arrived to the city, the city was closed to them. The people of London refused to let them in because they knew of the atrocities that they had committed in the area. Queen Margaret's early lead in this war had been reduced. Technically, the capital city, the root of power, had just rejected her and she was forced to withdraw to the north of England. In the meanwhile, with Richard, the Duke of York being dead, his successor, his son, Edward, another Edward, claimed his title of the Duke of York and with this, the leadership of the House of York. With Henry VI being sickly, weak and cowardly, Edward, the new Duke of York, was everything Henry VI was not. Standing at six foot four, the 18 year old man who was already a battle hardened warrior and proven on the battlefield. He was a charismatic leader of men and he took the capital city and held it where he gained a possession, not an item, but a person, the King Henry VI. Queen Margaret was in the North of England and her force was actually reinforced by the Scots of all people. This civil war had now just enclosed the entire British Isle. Everyone was involved. But things were about to get a whole lot worse. The Lancastrians had two sects of their force, one in the north with Queen Margaret, the other in the Midlands. Edward, the new Duke of York, marched his army up to meet the Midland force. He was dressed in fine armour and a rather amazing sight to see. On the 2nd of February 1461, he arrived at a battlefield known as the Battle of Mortimer's Cross in Herefordshire. On the morning of the battle, a amazing sight was seen. It's known as a Perilinian, where three suns rise into the sky. Medieval England was of course superstitious and took the sight of the three suns as an omen. The York troops began to retreat. They were scared at the sight of it, saying that God is not on their side. But their tall, inspirational leader, the Duke of York, turned things around and rallied his troops. He said that the three sons were a sign from God, that they would find victory and that God is with them. The Yorks and Edward were indeed victorious over the Lancastrians and Edward gained his emblem, sun in splendor. Perhaps the very epitome of chivalry, but this idea of chivalry, well, we'll talk about that later on. A few days later, Edward's ally, the Duke of Warwick, marched up to meet the Lancastrians on the Second Battle of St. Albans on the 17th of February, 1461. Henry VI was even present at the battle. Margaret hoped that his presence would bring her troops a strong will to fight. But the king, of course, being relatively mad at this point, was sitting under a tree singing to himself and no help at all. 
However, by the end of the battle, Queen Margaret and the Lancastrians had won, sending the Yorkists packing, and they regained possession of their king. After the battle, Edward needed something to get his troops behind him, get the Yorkists up again, and he came up with an ingenious idea. In March 1461, after the victory of Mortimer's Cross, he took the omen of the three sons as a sign that God wanted him to be the rightful king of England, and he crowned himself as Edward IV to confirm his rulership. Now we have two kings in England, Henry VI and Edward IV. With Edward, now the King of England, he marched his massive army up to a place called Towton on the 29th of March to meet the Lancastrian force once again. Queen Margaret and her husband Henry VI were waiting with a massive force of 30,000. Edward, on the other hand, had 20,000. While he was marching up the country, he gained more followers. The Lancastrians were waiting over the River Eyre. Edward's Yorkists sent soldiers to secure the bridge at Ferry Bridge. The Yorkists were, however, ambushed by the Lancastrians and massacred and drowned in the river. Henry VI and Queen Margaret caught wind of their small victory and sent a message to negotiate with Edward of York but he refused their terms. The Lancastrians saw that the time for war was coming. Edward, with a number of troops, attempted to break through the Lancastrian lions at this bridge point, but he wasn't entirely successful. The Lancastrians saw this coming and destroyed the bridge as they went backwards in a retreat. Edward built a ferry, which was then captured by the Lancastrians. The Yorks were stuck in no man's land. So they retreated and found another way around near Castleford, where they crossed the River Eyre. The next morning, with heavy snow falling, and it was freezing cold. Both sides knew it was time to settle things. The King and Queen, Henry and Margaret, with their Lancastrian forces, found high ground in the north. The Yorkists, with Edward, formed lines in the meadows of Towton. The Lancastrians sent a cavalry charge around the side of the Yorkists to flank them, but they were hidden in the snow. With the wind blowing in the faces of the Lancastrians, they struggled to even see their enemy in this now blizzard. Nonetheless, they loosed volley after volley of arrows, but not one arrow is said to find its mark. According to sources at the time, the Yorkists burst into laughter, seeing this pitiful response. The Yorkist archers ran into the field and under the veil of the snowfall sent a volley of arrows upon the Lancastrian archers. The Lancastrians started to die. They suffered heavy losses and had no opportunity to see their opposition. So they descended down from the high ground, so they may see their enemy in face-to-face -face combat. In a violent rush, the Lancastrian and Yorkist armies smashed together. The Lancastrian cavalry that had come around to flank the Yorkists arrived, and they almost routed the Yorkists. Edward himself had to rush to the left flank to stabilize the position. The Yorkists, being outnumbered, were pushed back by the Lancastrians, but out of the blizzard came a cavalry charge from the Yorkists, who flanked the Lancastrians, and their numerical advantage was wailing. In this melee of death and ice, the Yorkists pushed forward against the Lancastrians. Henry the Sixth and his queen, Margareta, were forced to retreat and escape to their allies back in Scotland. The battle was over. The Yorkists were victorious. It was the bloodiest battle that has ever been fought on British soil. The snow had been stained with blood as 13,000 Englishmen lay dead. As I said, we were gonna come back to the point of chivalry. The ideas of chivalry at this point in time had been held in the highest regard. During this battle, however, brother was fighting against brother and the ideas of chivalry were really dead. There was extreme levels of bloodlust that marked this battle. Skulls had been found on the site with over 20 or more wounds. This suggests that the soldiers didn't just kill each other. They intentionally mutilated dead bodies of their enemies. The Yorkists now had the upper hand, but 
this is not the end of the War of the Roses. Find out what happens next in part number two of the series. I really hope that you enjoyed that. Please like, comment and subscribe. Please also remember the charity link down below in the description. The more you know. Thank <music> you.